You are listening to Foreseeable, a production of Global is Asian, the flagship digital platform of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. In each episode, we invite an expert for a conversation relating to their field of study or experience and to find out what they foresee will happen in the future. Dr. Ng Kok Ho is Senior Research Fellow and Head of the Social Inclusion Project and Case Study Unit at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, NUS. His research interests are public housing policy, homelessness, income security, and minimum income standards. In August this year, Dr. Ng Kok Ho from the Social Inclusion Project at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy published findings from a nationwide count of the number of homeless people sleeping on the streets and in temporary homeless shelters during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the second nationwide street count of homelessness in Singapore. The first, conducted by the same researcher, was in 2019. Before this research, homelessness was generally a hidden issue. Most people were not familiar with the issue. Since 2019, public concern, media interest and policy attention have all grown. In this podcast, we will discuss with Dr. Ng on how the research came about, what we've learned and what we need to do next. Dr. Ng, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Dr. Ng, we want to talk about your study, the reasons behind conducting the study on homelessness. Mm. Uh, When we first began this work in 2017, um, that year we did a limited pilot, uh, we noticed that uh, counting the number of homeless people is actually just part of regular data collection in in many places, uh, but not yet in Singapore. So part of it was just a curiosity to know. Um, But of course, homelessness is a very important area uh, of research, right, Um, to social policy researchers and practitioners because homelessness is the most severe form of housing insecurity. So to to understand homelessness is to understand the needs of a very vulnerable population. And we could envision that uh, once we had done this research, the findings could potentially inform the planning of homelessness services, uh, the development of housing policies, uh, and so on. So I understand it coming in from the planning and policy point of view, but for the rest of us, why is it important for us to understand the issue? Hmm. Um, we, we often say that homelessness uh, is a severe or the severest form of housing insecurity because housing insecurity uh, exists on a continuum. Right. So before someone becomes homeless, they often go through several steps of increasing instability. They might be living with family and friends one week and then moving to sleep at the workplace the next and so on, uh, or relying on, on cheap hostels for a while until they can't afford it and, and so on uh, before they finally end up on the streets. Um, so while rough sleeping may, may feel like a very... Uh, out of the ordinary uh, housing condition, many more people experience those lower gradations of of housing insecurity. So our research on homelessness uh, is at its heart interested with why people don't have secure housing and what we can do about it. And and those issues concern all of us. This is a nationwide study, Dr. Ng, and you've produced quite a comprehensive tally on the homeless population in Singapore. And you would have known, and as we all know, that the homeless population, it's quite a hidden one. Many of us don't get to see. They're quite mobile as well. We may see them in one spot today, and then you go back there, and they aren't there anymore. So in order for your study to be comprehensive and successful, Talk to us about how this was done, bearing in mind that you could go back to the same place three times and all three times you either see different people or everyone's missing. That is absolutely true. Uh, This was a very logistically challenging study to do uh, and it was made more difficult by the fact that there was no local precedent 
of such research uh, at the point. So we had to review uh, international examples, learn from other people's practices, and then develop our own method and process and then test it and test it again. So the 2017 pilot gave us a chance to tweak some of these uh, data collection protocols and, and think about how we can adapt them to Singapore's context before our 2019 uh, nationwide study. But the fundamental challenge remains, as, as you've mentioned, homeless people are a mobile population and they don't present themselves to, to researchers. In fact, many of them uh, are very careful to conceal themselves uh, because of the social stigma of being homeless, uh, as well as the risk of involuntary institutionalization, which is still possible under the law. So they have good reason to kind of keep themselves hidden from view. So um, we, we had to recruit uh, and we recruited many uh, volunteers, train every one of them, provide very clear definitions of uh, who qualifies or doesn't qualify for what we consider to be homeless, provide a very simple data collection form to use so that people could use it consistently. And then at the end of it, we had to check the data very carefully. But in, in practice, it meant that the, our volunteer fuel workers uh, were walking around for two hours at a time to cover about 50 residential blocks uh, after 11 p.m. on foot. Uh, there was no other way to do it. There were no shortcuts. They had to do it, uh, this observational uh, data collection on foot. That was, that was what happened in the end. So at the end of the day, it's not just the researchers. You're just using ordinary people. These are your volunteers, many of whom may or may not have come across the issue that we're talking about today. And there must have been challenges, Dr. Ng. It's not as simple as giving people two forms and say, here, go, right? Did they receive any prior training? You know, what were the on-the-ground challenges that they had faced? We had to make sure that what the instructions we gave them were the right ones. So we we when we divided the map uh, of Singapore into zones, eventually it was almost 300 zones. There were some basic questions like how large should a zone be? So I, I tested it out myself. I asked my research assistants who are much taller than me and therefore walk faster. <laughs> so I, I asked them, so I asked people with, diff who, who, with different legs, right, to, to try our map, to see what was the right size, what was a good time to do it. You can't do the observation too early because the, the people would not have been settling down for the night yet. Um, but you don't want to do it too late because it will make it quite quite onerous on the volunteers. So, so we tested all these things, the right time to do it, how large an area, what's the, which places you don't have to visit, which places are critical not to miss, which tend to be hidden, where are the blind spots. We tested these things quite exhaustively uh, and then we trained the volunteers. In 2019, when we did the first nationwide count, we also incorporated a survey. Uh, so we took great care to recruit a team of social workers to help train the volunteer fuel workers uh, in approaching homeless people, how to introduce yourselves without sounding threatening or, or causing any anxiety because they are already very anxious, right? And how to do it in a respectful way uh, and so on. So we did role play and, and so on before sending people out. Uh, it, was, it was quite a long process. Out of curiosity, were there people who refused to talk to your volunteers? Oh, there were, there were. So, uh, and in testing out the the survey form and instrument, we encountered it ourselves. So we had to we had to uh, remind the volunteers. So if people reject you, don't take it personally. It's it's not you. It's just that if someone is sleeping in a public mm. place, they are already very anxious, and the first thing they think of is, "Are you police? Mm -hmm. Right? Or are you?" Are you someone from the authorities, right? They have so many questions in their mind. So uh, rejections are quite common, right? Uh, we uh, accept it as part of research, um, but we also try to try to adjust our practices to minimize the chances of that. So all, all the volunteers were instructed to introduce themselves with this first line, which is, I'm not from the government. <laughs> I'm a volunteer uh, from the National University of Singapore. Uh, that usually helps. Yeah, an academic institution would always help, with, especially when they hear university, right? Got to be good. We must talk about your survey and the results. This year's study was the second. It was nationwide. It's a street count. Talk to us about the first and the second study, the comparisons between the two. How did the second one compare to the first? <laughs> 
Uh, the results from the 2019 count uh, were that there were about a thousand homeless people. Um, and that includes both people sleeping on the streets that we counted uh, by eye, by observation. It also included uh, residents in temporary homeless shelters. Uh, that was data we, we obtained from the shelters. So uh, in total, it was around a thousand. Uh, two years on, in the middle of a global pandemic that we that we we know through all our lives into this array, um, we did the count again uh, using a very similar method. Uh, the result not so different. Still around a thousand in total uh, on the streets plus in the shelters. Uh, but one thing had changed, which is the composition of this population. When we did the count in 2019, they were almost all on the streets. Very few were in the shelters. But when we repeated the study in 2021, in the second year of the pandemic, 60% um, of them were on the streets. 40% were now in the shelters. So the shelter population had increased uh, more than six times. Uh, that was quite remarkable. That was the main change. But that was because, could it be that they had no choice because of COVID? Exactly. Um, many of them had sought shelter, uh, which is not something to be taken for granted, mm. right? So kind of locating homeless people, engaging them, persuading them to receive services and so on. These are all the usual challenges of uh, working with homeless people. But that was an, I mean, it was an extraordinary year um, and, and uh, an exceptional time, right? So at one point, especially during the circuit breaker, if you recall, uh, none of us were allowed outside except to buy food, right? So it was unlawful to be sleeping in public places. So it was at the time that many of them uh, approached the, the government and the shelters asking for a place uh, to sleep. Uh, at, the, at the same time, the government had anticipated uh, this, mm. this search and demand. So they too uh, worked with NGOs, private businesses and so on, which had premises that were kind of idling because many businesses were not allowed to operate as well as religious uh, I mean, places of worship, churches, temples, mosques, and so on. So uh, together, they, re they increase the shelter capacity. So both an increase in, in supply and demand, I think, contributed to the huge rise in the shelter population that year. I'm just wondering, Dr. Ng, how many of them actually remained in the shelters after the fact, after circuit breaker? Do you know? Mm. Uh, the numbers did subside, uh, but slowly, uh, which means uh, the shelter population did not vanish. I mentioned earlier that during the circuit breaker, that was the peak of the demand. That was also the peak of shelter capacity, because once the circuit breaker ended, uh, those places of worship reopened, right? And they would need their they will need the space back. Yes. Right. So so shelter capacity also shrunk. So some people moved out some into more stable housing. We've heard that some went back onto the streets. Uh, but a sizable number remain in the shelter system, uh, which, which reminds us of how long it takes right, to, to sort out stable housing arrangements uh, for people to transition into. Okay, so taking everything you've just said, comparing it to the results of the survey, what have you learned about the entire state of homelessness or rough sleeping in Singapore. You've talked about some of the changes that have been since before and after COVID. Let's talk about the differences, the causes. Mm. Um, when doing observation, there's a limit to how much data we can collect. Uh, it tells us the, the distribution, uh, the prevalence and the general profile of homeless people. Um, and that was, that was useful information. And we noticed that in fact, the geographical distribution of homelessness in Singapore uh, remained quite stable, uh, notwithstanding a global pandemic. So they were still found in most districts across Singapore. Uh, more of them were in older and poorer neighborhoods. The typical profile is an older Chinese man. Those things remain unchanged. Um, but through observation, we don't get to understand and hear people's experiences and don't get to... Uh, develop an understanding of what led them to that situation. So in, in this year's study, uh, we also incorporated uh, in-depth interviews. These are fairly long, an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, interviews with uh, residents in a homeless shelter uh, who, who entered those, shelter, those shelters uh, during the pandemic. 
And from what they told us, uh, and this is consistent with international research, we know there are three main causes of homelessness. The first is social. Uh, there's often a, a, a complete breakdown in, in family relationships before someone becomes homeless. And in Singapore, because our housing system uh, explicitly uh, prioritizes and caters for family units, so often to, to leave the family is to, is to lose housing. Uh, so that happens. And the degree of kind of the, the, the decay of the relationship is often so severe that they say even in a pandemic, there's no way they can go home, right? It, it can't be reversed. Uh, so that's the first cause is social. The second cause is economic. Uh, sometimes people have the stereotype that homeless people don't do any work or, or they, what we call in Singapore, they collect cardboard, right, for recycling and so on. Uh, that's not true. Uh, from our research, we have learned that many of them are in work, but they are in low paying work. So these are the jobs that uh, have been associated with low wages for a long time in Singapore, cleaning, security, uh, and, and so on. And on those wages, it's, it's very difficult to sustain the costs of uh, open market rentals once you have to leave the family home. So, so poverty and low-wage work is the second key driver. The third one is related to what I just said. It has got to do with uh, uh, lacking access to adequate housing options. Uh, I've just mentioned open market rentals are often unaffordable on low wages. People often try to live with family and friends, uh, but you realize that goodwill gets <laughs> used up and then you, they get asked to leave, right? Um, so that's not a long-term solution. Uh, so they often end up uh, trying for public rental housing within the HDB system. Uh, now, this is not an easy housing option to get into. Uh, it's in short supply. The criteria are strict. And also the conditions are quite difficult. So quite a number of homeless people we've spoken to have past experiences of living in public rental housing, which currently requires two single tenants to share a studio flat with no bedrooms. So that often leads to conflict and people concluding that they're better off sleeping outside. Right? So the lack of housing options is, is the third major factor. I'm actually quite keen to talk about something that is related to homelessness. I mean, the social impact, the physical, you know, the employment opportunities even, all of this will actually impact other areas in our lives. And we've been talking about this quite a lot, actually, especially over the last three years of COVID. Mental well-being, mental health issues, that's very important. Emotional issues, you need to be able to support the homeless in these areas. But I know it is very difficult to do that. You know, how do you actually get them to be plugged into the system. So you've studied this for quite some time now, Dr. Ng. How do you think we can plug this gap? Because mental health is not something to laugh about anymore. Everything you've spoken about leads to the fact that someone could be suffering mentally. Um, that's that's uh, absolutely true. Um, the conditions of homelessness are very, very harsh. So sometimes when people suggest that it might be a li lifestyle choice, right? People like the freedom or sleeping outdoors and so on. I would say that if you look at the conditions in which uh, homeless people sleep, uh, you wouldn't say that, right? It's clearly not a choice. Mm -hmm. um, the, the mental stress uh, is, is quite unimaginable. So in our interviews, people talk about how it's very difficult to get even a, a, a single night's sleep uh, without disturbance. People say they wake up after an hour, after two hours, because there are pests, depending on where they sleep, cockroaches and rats. They say they worry about people playing pranks on them or trying to steal from them by cutting their backs and their pockets. Um, people worry about where to find a toilet if they wake up in the middle of the night and need access to one. The next morning, they worry about where to wash, where to freshen up. And you mentioned employment as well. And if you can't find a place to freshen up and keep yourself uh, looking presentable, how do you get a job? Yeah. Right? And some of the toughest interviews we've, we've had to kind of listen to uh, were with homeless women. Uh, so all the difficulties uh, that I've just talked about, uh, imagine uh, that for, for, for women. It's, it's, it's just harder. Everything is, is harder. Um, I, I don't talk about this often, but some of the homeless men tell us that they sometimes 
carry an empty plastic bottle with them for the night just in case they can't find a toilet. But a woman can't do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So so you're as uh you're you're right that it's 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 also a mental health issue, right? When we can't get a good night's sleep. And if this goes on for weeks and in some cases years, right, what does that do to 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 our health, uh, to our persons, right? So um the, the gap is huge. I think there is a lot more we can do. As a society, I hope that as we develop greater awareness, uh, that homelessness is related to very complex factors to do with people's social relationships, but also to, to economic hardship and to the lack of housing services. We, we can be more understanding and be more respectful of the people who are homeless uh, in our communities because that itself uh, is a is is a is a barrier that um they tell us that sometimes residents make a complaint when when they spot homeless people in the void deck for no other reason than i feel unsafe because somebody is sleeping in a void deck right um and if you make the complaint the police will have to respond and the response is to ask them to move away so they moved to another void deck Right, nothing, nothing is achieved. I hope people can can learn to be more understanding uh, towards this this group and and know that they are they are just people going through a hard time. Uh, in terms of services, a lot more we can still do in terms of expanding our outreach and shelter services. Um, and and of course, as a researcher in a public policy school, uh, I'm always interested in in policy. Uh, in this case. I'm interested in in how housing policy can be improved to provide accessible and adequate options for homeless people. So a few things popped into my head as you were talking, especially the last point you made about people reporting if they see someone who could be rough sleeping in their neighborhood. I thought about inclusion. Very often we talk about having an inclusive society. Maybe this doesn't quite fit the bill, but if we were talking about inclusion and bringing everyone that lives in Singapore, that is a son or daughter of Singapore, into the fold, should we not also spare a thought for those who are homeless, sometimes out of reasons that they cannot control? It's not a matter of people saying, it's a lifestyle choice. I mean, you know, if you had a choice, would you choose that lifestyle? And there are those who may may have been incarcerated, who may have been released, and who aren't able to find themselves back to their own homes. So just a quick word on this about how we can actually do this as a society. How can we make it work for us and for them and share space? Sharing space is, is at the heart of this. Um, when I speak about homelessness, uh, when I give public talks, uh, often young people uh, will come up afterwards to talk to me and, and say how concerned they are. And they, they make this observation, which we have also spotted while doing our street counts, of defensive architecture. So I'm talking about features in on kind of street furniture, right? benches, seating areas in void decks and so on, uh, where we we sometimes attach an armrest or we fix little bumps on it just so that someone can lie down for a rest, for a bit of rest. And, and young people ask me, what can we do about it? Um, and I say, well, let the people who decided to install these features know that as a resident in that community, the spirit of doing these things does not represent the values that you identify with. Let them know you are not proud of being a resident of an estate that looks like this, right? Sometimes I, I also hear this kind of, I think, very disingenuous argument that if you remove defensive architecture, you're encouraging people to be homeless. It really doesn't work that way. <laughs> We've talked about the causes of homelessness, right? Yes, Having yes. benches with no armrest is not a cause of homelessness, but it may mean that someone who is homeless at least get a, a, a bit of a rest. Mm. And I guess there are many arguments to exactly what you just said, right? Good, bad, and ugly. But the other thing I wanted to pick up on was what you said about men versus women. I know majority of the homeless and the rough sleepers are men. Out of the thousand that we have are men. But there are women as well. Have you found in your studies, even in the past, that the reasons are the same 
or maybe the reasons are same and yet different? Women form about just 10%. Um, I say just, not, not to suggest that there should be more, right? Um, mm. But uh, they form a small minority of the street homeless population, uh, but quite a number among those that we interviewed in this year's study. This was, in fact, one of the questions I've been very keen to answer ever since we started this research, because people ask me, why are there so few women on the streets? Are the experiences the same? And what we've learned from this year's study the experience is, is harsher, right? And I stress this, homelessness is difficult for anyone, right? But for women, it's especially difficult. For all, the, all, for, for all those reasons that, that I've mentioned, right? Just everything becomes uh, harder because safety concerns are enlarged for women, mm -hmm. right? The need for privacy is, is, is of course, uh, of greater importance to women. Uh, and, and men generally feel they can fend for themselves and 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 so on are not the case for women so the experiences are generally much harder right as for why there are not more of them on the streets i mean i've heard a very kind of poetic explanation for this i read an interview uh, in the papers uh, with a shelter operator and when he was asked his answer was maybe people love their mothers more right? <laughs> <laughs> i thought that was very poetic uh, I think there might be some truth in that in, in the sense that women are less likely to be kicked out of the family home precisely because people instinctively appreciate the, the dangers of living on the streets. Um, so they are maybe in when there's a huge argument in the home, fathers are more likely to be kicked out. I mean, but that's only one, one dimension of it. What we found, uh, the key lesson that we learned, uh, in fact, from this year's study is that women are more likely to experience hidden homelessness, by which we mean they are living temporarily uh, of the goodwill of relatives, uh, extended family, friends, and so on, because they, they cannot take the risks of sleeping rough, they are moving around. Their living condition is extremely unstable. There is no security. There is no peace in that. Uh, but they they are still sheltered, right? And often their the pathways into street homelessness is a much longer one. Could it also be, Dr. Ng, that women are more likely to seek help? If you see a woman on the street, so personally, Perhaps I would approach a woman first before I approach a man. Obvious reasons. And it could be the same. So women, maybe they're more likely to seek help. They're also more likely to receive help. And some of these women also have children. And if you do, you are not likely to want to take your children unless the situation is so dire that you must take your children with you. Could that be one of the reasons? Yes. Um, a few of the, the female residents in the shelter that we interviewed uh, said exactly this. So during COVID, um, some of them were turned out of by friends or relatives mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons, but they couldn't go onto the streets and they have never slept outside before. They immediately sought help from government agencies. So when we so so there wasn't a process where they ended up on the streets and then were picked up by public agencies. They went directly when they ran out of options, they went directly to public agencies. When we asked them why, I remember one of their answers. She said, I'm a woman. Of course I can't sleep outside. The idea exactly that I must seek, I, I must seek help because I just cannot contemplate doing this. Absolutely right. Volunteers, you had a, a fear of not being able to find enough volunteers, but you found in both cases, both studies, that you perhaps had more than you needed. Could this be a sign of society Number one, waking up to the issue that we do have homelessness in Singapore and that they feel they must contribute, even if it's number one, first to a research piece and then hopefully doing something else after that. Yeah, the volunteers are amazing. <laughs> they are one of the, I think, most rewarding um, aspects of doing this study. Um, as you mentioned, we were quite anxious when we first did the nationwide count. Because to do it, we like to say Singapore is 
is small. It's a small country, but it's not that small. You <laughs> need to be everywhere on one night. Not that small at all. So we needed hundreds of volunteers. When we did the first nationwide study in 2019, we ended up recruiting more than 480 volunteers. Um, and we were so worried that if people didn't sign up, uh, we'll have to end up doing everything ourselves. By ourselves, I meant a team of three people. It was me and two research assistants. Wow. <laughs> um, so, so this study was only possible because of volunteers. Um, they've been big-hearted. They've been generous. They've been patient with us uh, during the training. And some of the kind of most memorable conversations I've had during this process was with the volunteers. Right. Um, we asked them to collect data only, but some of them write to me after that to share their experiences. Um, they say things like, uh, I've been in, living in this neighborhood for years, uh, but I've never known that there are homeless people here. Right? It, it makes me look at my neighborhood differently. Um, and one other person said this, I still remember. Uh, she said, we are such a wealthy society we shouldn't need to have people sleeping outside. This is not right, right? Uh, and, and I won't be surprised if many of these volunteers uh, in our project, our research project, uh, went on to volunteer with the outreach groups. Mm. Yeah. And you're likely right. You know, Many of them would perhaps want to do something and find groups to do that with. I must ask you about the young people. Your volunteer group would be a quite wide range of people, yeah, over different demographics. You also had young people in the volunteer group, but in a separate conversation we had, you also mentioned that young people in schools are also quite keen on this subject. Talk to us a bit about that. Why the 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 interest in this particular topic, why they're wanting to be involved in this topic, bodes well and is good for Singapore. When we first started this research, I, uh, we had to do a lot. We had to work very hard to get word out there uh, that this was an important issue. We need to be concerned. Uh, we need to think about how to do better right, as a society. Um, a few years on now, um, one of the signs that I think word is now out there and circulating in our community uh, is when young people, students, uh, write to me to say that they have to do a school project and they've picked homelessness as, as their topic. And, and I love this. I love that they're so so interested in social issues, that they're so concerned, some of them. And, and I've had students writing to me from secondary schools, from ITEs, uh, from, from the polytechnics and the universities. Uh, they say they worry about this. Uh, they're upset. They want to do something about it. They want to make things better. Right. And, and as far as possible, we, I try to make time for them to, to have conversations. And in the last two years, actually, we've been working with a polytechnic mm. uh, to design their final year project, right? where their task is to redesign void decks so that these are more accommodating to a wide range of people in our community. That is now their final year project. Uh, and, and I'm so pleased that it's something that young people have taken to their hearts uh, and they want to take ownership of this issue. And I've always believed that if young people in any society are moved mm -hmm. to do something about an issue, then surely there is hope. I always believe there is hope. But I also agree with you that when young people take an interest in some of these topics which we feel might be better suited to adults, policymakers, researchers like yourselves, and people who run the various charities and shelters. But when young people actually even show a little bit of interest, there is hope. If I may ask you, from your dealings with especially secondary school students, and they've done their research project, and in the process of doing it, what insights have you heard from them? What are some of the whispers that you might have heard from these young kids? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ah. So when young people do these projects, sometimes they are quite ambitious. So they say they want to interview homeless people uh, mm -hmm. and, and do a survey and so on. So, so we have to, to cautiously advise them uh, to set realistic expectations. Because like I mentioned, uh, we had to work very hard just to locate homeless people right, for the count. And then we also talked about how the rejection rate is quite high. Um, it's not easy to, to engage homeless people, uh, to, to earn their trust and have them 
be be in a conversation with you for data collection. Uh, so these are difficult. Uh, so what young people can do sometimes they do projects where they kind of audit the 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 physical environment in the void deck and think about how that is hospitable or not to homeless people. Uh, they try to read about various innovative shelter designs in other countries, and then they think about whether that can be applied to Singapore or not. Uh, so this, this a lot of their projects are, are like this, right? They are taking information that is out there, and then they try to apply it, they crit critique it, and then they synthesize it. Uh, and I think for 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 what they are doing, right, as a class classroom assignment, I think that's a that's already amazing. It's brilliant. It's so different from when, I don't know, when I was in school, when you asked to do a project, you wouldn't go down this path. You'd always take the path that's easy. <laughs> but I'm glad they're yes. not taking that path that is easy yeah. because this is a very difficult topic to talk about. And some of them would have difficulty even speaking to the more elder members of their family about this issue. Because mm -hmm. as you said, right at the beginning, it is quite a hidden issue the homeless are mobile. So in all the research you've done, the various surveys, in the work that you've done in this area, what has been the deepest impression on you from this study and others? Mm. Um, having kind of research um, on various dimensions of social exclusion now for some years, it is doing this work is still hard. Um, it has been interesting, but also tiring. Um, it's been sometimes aggravating, but also very inspiring. Um, just to imagine the kind of hardships people have had to endure uh, for years, sometimes at a stretch, uh, sleeping outside. Uh, they show great resourcefulness, resilience, um, just to get by, right? Um, it's it's really very very hard to imagine. Um, the lesson I take away, um, is that we should not, we should not underestimate the hardships of people uh, facing various forms of disadvantage. Um, we should take very seriously, uh, the various barriers that they still face in our society, and I think that should move and inspire us to to find every way possible to, to do things better. Dr. Ng, you've got all the numbers now. You've got all the insights. You've got all the knowledge, hindsight, foresight, everything. I want to ask you, though, if you had your wishes, your hopes, and perhaps a crystal ball to peer into the future, what would you like to see? What do you wish for to, in, in order to change the landscape even just by a little bit? If I had one wish, um, and there's of course two for you, but if, <laughs> <laughs> if you You can have two one, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my biggest wish would be that uh, we need to change the way we think and talk about housing. Um, we have achieved so much uh, in housing as a nation and as a society. It's no mean feat to house 80% of the population in a public housing system. There is no equal uh, out there, right, internationally. Uh, so, so that is remarkable. Yet it also boggles the mind that we struggle to, to kind of crack this problem of homelessness that currently stands at a total number of 1,000, right? It's but a small small, small, tiny fraction of our public housing system. I think to, to, to really get to the root uh, of homelessness and to, to make sure there are better housing options out there for people who are not just currently homeless, but homeless people in future, we need to refocus our attention on housing needs. I think uh, for many years now, we've gotten used to designing housing policy to promote home ownership. Right, uh, because that that of course has, has its strengths, right? Uh, but we for too long sought to differentiate people in terms of responsible homeowner versus non-homeowner or or irresponsible homeowner and so on. Uh, 
um, and, and we are losing focus uh, that uh, the first responsibility of any public housing system is to attend to people's housing needs, right? Um, and if we can do that, reorientate ourselves, right? When assessing people's eligibility for public rental housing and other shelter services to focus on the extent of housing need, then I think the problem of homelessness, right, uh, will become much more straightforward to tackle. Any final thoughts, Dr. Ng, before we wrap our conversation? Mm. Um, doing this research, I think in the last few years, and then looking at how the ecosystem around the topic of homelessness uh, has changed alongside uh, the progress in research. And I'm talking about this huge rise in public interest, uh, in media attention, uh, but also... Uh, a policymakers' attention to the issue of homelessness, um, I think it, it reassures me um, that uh, of the importance of independent, uh, rigorous social research that seeks out um, issues that are still just emerging or that are hidden, um, producing evidence uh, that can subsequently help in in advancing public making. Um, I'm reassured that. Uh, social research will continue, must continue to play a key role uh, when we tackle the social issues of the future. Dr. Ng, must thank you very much for a very insightful and actually quite inspiring discussion on the homelessness issue in Singapore. And I do hope that you can count us in your numbers as we move forward to try to change even a small change, you know, even if it's just a step up to volunteer with you, is a move in the right direction in order to tackle the issue and hopefully to change the landscape of home ownership and homelessness in Singapore. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susan. It's been my pleasure. If you'd like to subscribe to the Global is Asia newsletter, look for the link in the description or find us at our Facebook at Global is Asian.